Our first speaker tonight is University of Michigan's Earth and Environmental Sciences professor, Adam Simon. I've had the opportunity to learn so much from him over these past couple of months about his own research, which is on energy consumption, renewable resources, and how we create our human identities around the environments that we live in. I hope you all are inspired by his enthusiasm and energy and feel motivated to take action after hearing from him tonight. Please welcome Adam Simon. Thanks, Zoe. All right, after two years of virtual teaching, I trust you can hear me. But I'm going to ask you to do something off the bat. Close your eyes. Trust me. Nobody's going to goose you. Nobody's going to steal your purse. Close your eyes. Take yourself back to this morning. What did you do when you woke up? Grabbed your phone. Phone was on the charger. Battery was full. Got out of your bed. Was your room already warm? Energy all night long kept that room warm for you. Did you go into the kitchen and in the kitchen open the refrigerator where you pulled out refrigerated food that is safe to eat? Did you pull food out of the freezer? Did you put food in the microwave? Press a few buttons. Presto, your food was warm for breakfast. Did you take any medicine? How about a cholesterol-lowering drug like myself? All right, how about an antidepressant like myself? Did you make coffee? Did you make tea? Did you boil the water? Of course you did. Now, when I think about all of those things, that's just your morning. Then what'd you do the rest of today? All day long, you consumed energy. You consumed energy when you were sleeping because that phone was being charged while you were dreaming. You consumed energy at breakfast, at lunch, at dinner, we're consuming energy in this room right now. All of us have that in common. Every one of us, no matter how we vote, no matter who we vote for, no matter if we pray or who we pray to, we all share an interest in having energy to make our lives possible. Now, our use of energy has come at some costs. So you see these four words and phrase, excuse me, these words and phrases on the screen, right? You hear about them all the time. You can open your eyes now, please, all right? Everything is still around you. Nobody got you. Climate change, greenhouse gases, renewable energy, carbon neutrality. You hear them all the time. Doesn't matter if you're listening to Fox or MSNBC or CNN all the time. New York Times, Wall Street Journal, all the time. What do they mean? What do these words actually mean, right? How do they manifest for us in our daily lives, our shared lives? Well, over the last hundred years, scientists in my field, Earth and Environmental Science, have done a phenomenal job at trying to understand how our use of energy, namely fossil fuels, where we combust coal and oil and natural gas, and the energy from that irreversible exothermic reaction that we call combustion, that's what powered our lives. That's what powered us from the Industrial Revolution. That's what contributed to who we are today. That's why we can take a cholesterol-lowering drug. That's why we have antidepressants. That's why we have all the modern medicine we have today. Energy is embedded in our lives, and our lives are radically different than they were 200 years ago. Since 1880, you're looking here at global temperatures. Red is hot, blue is cold. We know without any doubt that Earth's surface temperatures and Earth's ocean temperatures are increasing. And there is one answer, and that answer is the contribution of carbon dioxide to Earth's atmosphere from the combustion of fossil fuels. There's no other answer. I don't care what one out of a million scientists you've heard. There's one answer. So we know why these temperatures are increasing. But what does that even mean? Right? When I teach classes and I tell somebody in my class, well, the temperature in Nebraska is a, a, a one degree warmer than it was 100 years ago. Huh? What does it mean? What these data have done for society, and I see this through the lens of the college students I teach, they have either paralyzed you with existential anxiety because you don't know what to do, 
Or you shrug your shoulders like, mm, it's a little warmer. Okay, less snow. Well, what I want to do now is show you the data that resonate with people. People who I engage with. You go to Georgia, the crop yields for peaches in Georgia are decreasing because the winters are getting warmer. Georgia's the peach state. Not in a decade. You look around Michigan, Michigan's winters are getting warmer. Ah, oh, that's fantastic. Less snow to shovel. It's not the way it works. It has negative impacts on the crop yield of apples. If you grow apples in Michigan when we have slightly warmer winters, and by slightly, I'm talking here one degree, two degree warmer, you get soft, mushy apples like this one. Now, some people in the audience are probably sitting there thinking, yeah, it's okay. We can cook with them, Adam. We can sweeten them up. But if you're a farmer and you're growing peaches in Georgia or you're growing apples in Michigan and your crop yield is what puts money on the table, then your crop yield is part of your identity. And you're seeing your crop yield decline. So we have real economic problems in areas where farmers depend on temperatures to be within a certain range. We see the same thing for wheat, right? We call this area of the United States the breadbasket because that's where historically we as European immigrants have grown our wheat. You go to Zingerman, you buy a loaf of bread, that's where your wheat comes from. But if you look at the screen, what do we see? We see that the climate where wheat grows today is moving north. So when my 16-year-old son who's sitting here is my age, Iowa won't grow wheat anymore. The same is true for corn. Nebraska, the corn husker state, no more corn. Climate is changing. And when you talk to farmers in these areas, they see it. It's tangible. It resonates with them more than a number on a map on CNN. So this is where you can start a conversation. We see this globally. Red means bad. If we look around the entire earth, we see that climate change is going to decrease crop yields around the entire world as population increases to 10 billion over the next 30 years. So population's growing, going up, crop yields are going down. Now, what if I were to tell you we have a solution for this. It's magic. Potion. What if I were to tell you we have a solution where we can keep the temperatures in Georgia in that sweet spot for peaches to grow. We can keep the temperatures in Michigan in that sweet spot for nice, tart, juicy, crisp apples to grow. We can keep the temperatures in that sweet spot where Nebraska remains the corn state for real. America's breadbasket remains America's breadbasket. And we can feed our growing population. The answer is we have to transition entirely to an energy infrastructure around the entire world that is powered by renewable energy. The map on the left shows how we can do this in Southeast Michigan. In Southeast Michigan, if we cover the land shown here in pink and brown, with wind and solar, meaning large commercial scale wind turbines, which have no impact on crop yields. They do not reduce the amount of farmland. And we convert some arable land to utility scale solar. And we combine that with currently available battery storage technology. We can live a 100% hashtag electrify everything life. Everything is electric. No more gas hot water. No more natural gas heating. Everything is electric with that land. I promise you, promise you the data are correct. Right? After all, I'm up here and, well, you're not. So trust me that the data back this up. Right? We don't need that much space. We commonly get pushback. Oh my God, wind turbines. They're going to kill so many birds. Really? Not as many birds as get killed by feral cats or crash into windows. Oh my God, solar panels, they're going to leak into the ground. Really? We have to do some fact checking of these intuitive theories. We also have to remember that this involves a change of identity. 
for the individuals and the communities where we need to build grid-scale renewable energy. We're not going to get there if we call these people stupid. We're going to get there if we go into the communities, we meet, we engage with them, and we respect their identities and their values. And we help them transition from where we are now to where we need to be. That's what we have to do. Now, how can we do it? And can we do it fast enough? Darn skippy. Absolutely. Humans do this. We have done this. We're ideators. We're innovators. We're doers. Map on the left. Imagine New York City, 1900 Fifth Avenue, right? Here's you walking down the street, Fifth Avenue, New York City. Skip to the loo. Oh, horse shit. Skip to the loo. Oh, horse pee. Skip to the loo. Horse shit. It was the shit and pee extravaganza. Seriously. Everybody's on a horse and buggy. There were 100,000 people in the United States that made horse buggies in 1900. 100,000 people. Public health nightmare. Look at the image on the right. 1913, same Fifth Avenue. Where's the horse and buggy? It's not there. 13 years, poof, gone. Magic, right? God is a phenomenal woman, and she works it the way she wants it. She looked at that New York City and said, hmm, horse and buggy, poo and pee, mm-mm. And we transitioned, we adapted in a decade. Nobody was on a horse and buggy in 1913. Now, when we transitioned to combustion engine vehicles, that also caused the addition of CO2 to the atmosphere, which we now know has caused temperatures to increase. So we need to transition from combustion engine vehicles to electric vehicles. I promise you, everybody's going to do it. When my son Ethan's my age, everybody's going to drive an electric vehicle. And I'll show you why, and you'll be convinced. We can change on time scales that we need to change if we decide individually and collectively that we want change to happen. And what's critical for young adults in this room is to look at these images and say, that is possible. It is possible to imagine by 2035, we are hashtag electrify everything because we've made these transitions. John F. Kennedy wanted to put a man on the moon in a decade. We did that. We're now talking about sending human beings to Mars. We do this. It's who we are. Why are we going to do it? First of all, it's economics. Doesn't matter your political affiliation. You're looking here at the price to generate electricity. Solar and wind are the cheapest way to generate electricity. So if you're a thoroughbred capitalist, right, and you care about profit margin, and you have several ways of generating and selling electricity, what you want to do is you want to generate electricity at the lowest cost to maximize profit. <laughs> what do we see? It's solar and wind, baby. It's not natural gas. It's becoming economically uncompetitive. Guess what's not even up here? Sound it out for me. I'll give you the word, right? Starts with a, and then we've got a, and then we've got a, and then we've got a, coal. Coal's not even up here because it's no longer competitive. No financial institution on the planet is funding coal. So economics is the number one reason why this transition is going to happen because it's the cheapest way to generate electricity worldwide. And we see this happening in states that when you take a look at this, if you're a thoroughbred liberal and you look west and say, oh, those Midwesterners, I'm just not sure. They're not progressive. Look at this one. These farmers are pretty smart. They see the way the wind's blowing, right? They see the wind is blowing. Boy, I put up a turbine and the wind just moves it like this, and I get electricity, huh, that's independent, that's resilient. Boy, I don't need oil, I don't need natural gas. <laughs> now forgive the accent, but Iowa, 58% of their electricity is from wind. Kansas, 43%, right? Politics don't matter. Why is this happening? It's the cheapest way to provide electricity, and everybody wants to have the lowest electricity bill possible. Full stop, okay? We see this happening off of our coasts. Economics is why Equinor, the Norwegian energy company, 
is developing what will be the two largest offshore wind farms in North America. These red areas on the map will provide energy, hashtag electrify everything energy, for more than a million homes in New York. If we want to reduce temperature increases to keep peaches growing in Georgia and apples growing in Michigan and corn growing in Nebraska, this is what we need to do and we need to do it now. We can't continue talking about doing it. We have to do it. We have to be okay with it. We have to be okay that if we have a vacation house on Cape Cod and we see a wind turbine way out there when we squint, we're okay. We have to be okay that there may be some what can be perceived as negative impacts. But on balance, this is what we need if we want to transition to hashtag electrify everything, a carbon neutral energy infrastructure. Now, I don't pretend to be a model, although I think I do look pretty good. Right? But this is my wife on the left. End of the day, comes home in what was a $52,000 purchase for us. Most expensive car I've ever bought. It was my 50th birthday present to me. Well, she agreed, so it was to us. What happens at the end of the day? She leaves her office, she gets in the car, she drives home, she plugs it in. Convenience. So economics is number one. Convenience is two. My wife, I can't tell you the last time my wife said, oh my God, Adam, I so miss going to gas stations. Those gas handle pumps, I love them. Just picturing all the people that blew in their nose, that went to the bathroom without washing, and then they touch that pump, and I go to the gas station, and I say, mmm, germs. That's what I want. Yeah. Nobody wants that. So this is convenience. It's a 120-volt out, outlet, right? These are solar panels DIY in my backyard, and this is a battery array in my basement. This is DIY. You can order this stuff off Amazon. Okay? I challenge every person who's in this room tonight, if you're in our income bracket, which is about 220 gross, you can look it up. We both work for the state. All salaries are public. If you're in our income bracket and climate crisis, climate change is a crisis for you, you wake up and you go to the mirror and you're like, oh my God, existential anxiety, climate crisis. And you're not driving an EV something is wrong. If climate change is a crisis for you, you've got to act. You've got to do something. We have to move beyond talking about doing something and actually do it. And this is, we have four kids, this is our fifth kid's college right here. I don't pretend that it's cheap and I don't pretend that everybody needs to do this or has the money to do it. Not in any way, shape, form, or fashion. Right? As somebody who grew up on welfare and free lunch and would have been a Blavin scholar at the University of Michigan, which is for students who spent significant time in foster care, this was beyond my wildest dreams when I was a kid. But now I'm doing it, and everybody in my income bracket should be doing it if climate change is a crisis for you. One slide, just to make sure I send the message we need to mine. We can't build renewable energy infrastructure without mining the critical metals for that infrastructure. And that's something that is really hard right now to convince a lot of environmental groups. We need responsible mining. Have to do it. So what can you do, right? What can you do? Every one of you who's eligible can vote. If we look at the voter turnout by age group, 18 to 29 year olds have the lowest voter turnout. Which means that your voice is not being represented, whether it's Lansing or Sacramento or Annapolis or Washington DC, your voice is not being represented. How does this manifest? It results in obstructionists being, being elected who continue to put roadblocks up for renewable energy. I'll give you this example. In 2016, if every 18 to 29 year old had voted by party, the other party would have won by 107 electoral votes. So you have to vote. And this is my last slide. There's a QR code here. Every student needs to vote. Why is that important? Because as individuals, 
yes, we can do rooftop solar. Yes, we can buy an EV, and that is having an impact. But by voting, we can elect people at the local, state, and national level who will work to provide tailwinds for renewable energy. And that takes place-based public policy. Groups like the Michigan League of Conservation Voters, they will be out en masse this year. So I'm pretty sure in Ann Arbor, most people here accept climate change. I'm pretty sure most of you accept that it's the addition of carbon dioxide from the combustion of fossil fuels that is causing our climate to change faster than it otherwise would. We can stop that if we transition. We've made similar transitions in the past on similar timescales that we need to today. So we have to act. No more sitting on the sidelines. Every one of us has to act. So thank you very much.